Good evening. Hey guys, happy Thanksgiving Eve. Ooh, Thanksgiving <laughs> Eve, that's yeah. right, I know. Can you see, we got the holiday spirit going on here. We got the Christmas tree in the background, even though it's not even been Thanksgiving yet. But I love this time of year, Terry. Yeah, it's, I it's a wonderful time of year. Yeah. I do, I tell you what, there is so much to be thankful for. There is. And man, am I ever thankful that we have been establishing our hearts in grace. <laughs> <laughs> and that we can For the last 30 35 years. <laughs> yes. And it's been, it's been a journey. It Sometimes really has Sometimes really a slow journey. But yeah. man, we I, we have still been moving forward. Right, we have. And believing that God is better than what we have ever imagined him yeah. to be. Robin, sometimes we get a little bit of information that really propels us forward. And so we true. we get a different lens or we look at things. We look at the scriptures differently whenever we get that information. And... Uh, and that's one of the great things about this journey is that, uh, you know, we can just be okay with where we're at right now. But I know that in six months from now and a year from now, we'll be further along. We'll have more information and it will just bring us into a greater relationship of love with our father than we ever well, had. And when love really begins to be what your heart's established in, the grace and the favor and the love of God. Yeah. I tell you, you can feel safe with where you're at yeah. because you can know that you're going to grow. You know that it's not, that you don't have to have everything just perfect right. in what you believe <laughs> or have it, have it all down, that you're safe, that God loves us right where we're at. Yeah. And, and he chose us and picked us out before the foundations of the world. He's not holding any of our, our, our mistakes yeah. or our misunderstandings against us. He's not offended oh, at man. our of us not understanding everything the right way. Thank goodness. He, he cares about us. And I yeah. think when you establish your heart in that and fear begins to lead the way you look and approach God, yeah. oh my goodness, it changes everything. Absolutely. It really does. And man, what have we been talking about? I'm telling you, that has right. really was a doctrine in our lives that has been foundationally created a lot of fear. And right. that is the doctrine of hell. Right. And so Robin, we've been, we've just kind of started scratching the surface of this. Yeah. I mean, I, I taught on this in our church a couple of years ago yeah. and I have a 14 part series. If you want to listen to that while we're doing this the next few weeks, but uh, hopefully we add some more things to yeah. this than even what I taught back there. Um, but, uh, Robin, this was a big one, you know, wh whenever, uh, whenever I began to see some of these things, you know, 10, 11 years ago, whenever my eschatology changed and I really began to see some of this stuff, it really, uh, made me excited. Yeah. Because anything I'm telling you that produces fear in our lives, we have to question and, and we have to ask ourselves, does it pass the grace and the love test. Right. And 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 when the Bible clearly says there is no fear in love. Yeah. And right. I'm telling you, I think we should read our opening scripture that sure. we always start with because I think Go it's ahead. just so foundational. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 through 9. Yeah. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is so important. Reading that right there was caused us to question things right. because the God that 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 the uh, was written about in the Old Testament did not line match, up with Jesus. Which, yeah, he was not how they perceived him and what they wrote him down to be like was not what Jesus modeled. And Robin, the, the, again, the title of our message, I don't know if we've said it. We but, haven't yet. Um, you know, hell, we missed the point. But the truth is, is that because they didn't recognize Jesus as God, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, a lot of the Jewish people uh, rejected Jesus because he was opposite of the God that they had grown up with. Because the God they had grown up with was about rules and punishment. punishment. He was transactional. If you didn't do everything just right, does this sound a little bit like with the doctrine of hell a little bit? If you don't right. do everything just right, then you could be in jeopardy of being eternally separated from God and spending a place in eternal conscious and that's, torment. And that's what we've said. That's what yeah. we've said. Yeah. I mean, that is where we have taken that punitive and transactional. Now, we're going to talk talk today about how um, uh, looking at how the word Sheol in the Old Testament was translated um, in the King James Version into hell. And we're going to talk about why 
historically probably those things happen right. and how it was mistranslated. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it has been about fear and control and, and it has, but, but those teachings and that punitive and transactional view of God that they had and that we saw written down in the Old Testament made it easy to buy to into that. To jump into that, yeah. It caused and, us to miss and, the point. And Robin, there's so much information even that, you know, that we could give out and and, but we're and just going to go slow. We're going to try to go give slow and, and, and give you some info where, I mean, you can take a look at things for yourself. And I think Terry and I think it's just what has been our logic to look at this. Right. What have the questions been that we've asked ourselves that, and we and that have caused us to dig and look at things when it hasn't lined up to the love of God? Yeah. When it hasn't lined up to what Jesus modeled. And I love this statement, Terry. If you want to read that, that is so good. Our doctrine should not determine how we look at grace and love. Grace and love have to determine how we look at our doctrines. Man, that's life changing. And so the scripture, I don't think you finished it in uh, Hebrews 13, 8 and 9. It says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Right. Various and strange doctrines would have Jesus opposite of the God of the Old Testament. Just to give you a little thought there. For it is good that the heart, your heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So if Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever, grace is the same yesterday, today today and forever. The father is the same yesterday, today and forever, because Jesus said, I only do what I hear my father. I only do what I see my father do. And I only uh, say what I hear my father say. So, so a strange doctrine would be opposite of favor, opposite of making Jesus and God looking the same. So we've got some real issues that we're going to have to work through. Yeah. So, and Robin, we've been saying this is if what we believe is truth, that it will stand under the scrutiny of our investigation. And I will tell you, there's a lot of things that we have been taught that most people are afraid uh, for a number of different reasons. Most people are afraid to go look at the information and look at the facts, look at history and see what was back there. And because whenever you start finding some of these things out, it really shakes your your belief oh system. It doesn't shake me off of Jesus. No, it doesn't no. shake me off of the Father. It makes them better, far yes. better than what they've ever oh been. Gosh. It makes you feel so safe in your relationship with God, it really begins to look like unconditional love yeah. when you begin to put some of these doctrines that have created fear in our lives under the scrutiny of investigation. Right. And this is what we're another nugget we're going to bring out tonight as we look at how they define the word Sheol in the Old Testament. Yeah. But one of the things is that we must not assassinate our father's character with our doctrines. Right. And I feel like when we say God loves us unconditional, but then we say that he um, could, is going to judge us on our performance or by not saying some prayer or, or, or having not being able to grasp who Jesus was or being able to be explained to it, us the right way right. and had so many misunderstandings about God that we never could come and grasp and say, well, and he's going to send us into eternal conscious torment forever. Right. For a finite life. For a finite life. That that probably had all these misunderstandings and oh, God man. knew that there was misunderstandings. Robin, that, that's a great point. That's yeah. a super point. Oh my point. goodness. So Jesus came to show us the heart of the Father. Right. But we're only going to be able to see that is if we do, uh, if we d look at the Bible the right way. Right. And we recognize that the Old Testament was about people with a limited view of God riding down their journey. And they accuse God of some things that if you look at what Jesus modeled, could not have been God. This is true. This yeah. is true. So we must filter everything that we believe through what Jesus revealed to us in his life, his death, his resurrection, everything that, that he did. So as we continue to ask questions about hell and about how this doctrine measures up against the love and the grace of God on our journey, we, we begin to see that we begin to realize that even from a young age, most oh of goodness. us were disciples of this uh, thought process of eternal conscious torment. And whenever you start seeing the facts and the mistranslation errors and all of these kinds of things, it really throws your old bad doctrines out the window. 
Thank goodness. So we were we were convinced whenever we were young, we were convinced of this doctrine of eternal conscious torment hell before we ever opened our Bible, before we ever had relationship with God our own, the table of religion was set, yeah. fear was set, oh and we goodness. began to go down a a fear tunnel that left our minds deeply embedded with this thought process of eternal conscious torment. Terry, talk about missing the point. Man, we be, this, just what you just said, yeah. we, we, it, we became, the point of our relationship with God became about fear of punishment, okay. missing punishment, instead of about this. We've read this before, and I'm going to read this, because this is the point of our relationship with God. It's out of Ephesians chapter 1 in the Message Bible, and it said, long before he laid down his earth's foundation, he had us in mind, has settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his yeah. love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He yeah. wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. I don't say anything about performance. I don't say anything about fear right. in, in any of that. But because of the doctrine of hell that had been taught we, and laid out before us, Everything in our relationship with God became had this underlying foundation of fear, fear of punishment and fear of separation. Yeah. From God. And Robin, I think just like those scriptures you just read, we begin to feel safe and we begin to feel safe to ask questions yeah. and really consider that maybe God was far better than what we thought he was. Oh my goodness. That maybe yes. he didn't abandon his creation to <laughs> fear, a place of that. despair, pain, torment and defeat. Maybe he really loves us. Yeah, because you know? man, that kind of thinking has created such a feeling of unworthiness in us, and 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 such a torment in our thinking. Yeah, that to, that this doctrine that has become an underlying cornerstone in what we believe from the time we were a child has has had tentacles and has, has affected everything right. that we've thought and believed. Well, Robin, I, and you and I were talking about this before we got on here tonight is the, is just the, the gospel of the kingdom of life with the father that Jesus began to display and the things yeah. that he began to teach. He, he was, it was never, you go back and look at it and you'll see it as we, over the next few months, as we continue on in this, but um, it was never about uh, missing this place of hell or eternal conscious no. torment and going to heaven. The message of the gospel of the kingdom was about aeonious life, life in the age, life in the moment. Yes, will it continue in the future? Of course it will. And like Ephesians 2 says that in the ages to come, God will have an opportunity to show us his kindness. And so Robin, I've got to... I, I have, com you and I both have committed ourselves to yeah. the love of the Father. And so everything has to fit within that. I don't believe God is uh, one way one day and another way and the, an another day. I think God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And Jesus was the final authority and the final word Man, on this how whole far thing. off, how much we began to miss the point yeah. when Jesus so clearly came to show us that life with the Father was about a loving relationship with our Papa God. Yeah. And he and he was about inclusion and acceptance that had nothing to do with fear. Right. Nothing to do with fear of punishment. Right. But he came to remind us that we were chosen. Yeah. Loved that we were his kids that were picked out before the very foundations of the world. And that's po that's that's positive and that's powerful. Yeah, it is. Uh, Robin, it's amazing to me how far we can be removed from the truth systematically. Oh, yeah. You know, and I was reading this to you yesterday, NASA in their space program, they make a lot of adjustments along their journey so that they can hit the target. For instance, if if you're off just a little bit oh, yeah. as you're going to the moon, then by the time you travel all those miles, you completely miss what you're shooting for. They will miss their point. Man, have we missed the point? point. And not 
intentional, not, in, no, not intentionally, we, no. like, at least in our lifetime. And we're going to look at maybe there were some agendas when some oh, of these things boy. were translated wow. back in the 1600s. But but we, I, I have no doubt that the mentors and the people that taught us before, they meant well. or even when we were teaching these sure. things, we meant well sure too. Sure we did, yeah. See, and the thing is, you know, like if NASA makes adjustment adjustments, why don't we encourage ourselves on this grace journey to continue to make adjustments? We need to allow the spirit of God within us, the spirit of love to trump all of the thought processes like that you and I have invested our lives into yeah. with his overwhelming nature yeah. of love. We need to question all of our systems which we have so strongly believed in. And like Dr. Phil says, how some of that stuff been working for you? <laughs> not well, very well. Not very time. good in a lot of yeah. instances. So, but we need to really look at all of our systems yeah. that create fear in our life yeah. because the gospel of, of life with the Father should not be creating fear. It should be creating faith. Yeah. It should, you know, and if it creates fear, it's really not the gospel. And we've missed the point. And we've missed we the point. We have missed the point because yep. the point is about relationship with a loving Papa God. Yeah. Life with the Father is about love and safety, not about fear of punishment. Yeah. So, right on, last week we talked, we we're talking about hell. We're, you know, we're applying grace in this area. We talked about lost in translation, and we could call all of our. Lost in and it's all talking about this to some degree. <laughs> but last week we talked about where did we get our English word from? Yeah. So English word help. So it's the dramatic word that really meant the total opposite of eternal conscious torment. Right. It meant to conceal, cover, and to protect. Like the word helmet yeah. is originates out of that. It's like right. a helmet protects and covers and conceals the head. And then I love this because I was saying last week how, you know, growing up on the farm and had, coming from a family of farmers that the word hell was used in Europe during the Middle Ages when potato farmers would hell their potatoes. That during the winter they would cover, conceal, and protect the potatoes in, in the ground, covering them with dirt. These farmers refer to this process of putting the potatoes in hell. Right. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> so we kind of uh, do that with dead bodies. We put that we, we held do. them. We protect. We, we cover them with yes. a casket, and then we put them in the ground yes. and cover them. And this is for the purpose of care and protection, not for torment or not and punishment. For punishment, no. right? And so, Robin, there, so so this word hell was not even in Jesus's vocabulary, nor yeah. the early. No. The early, early church, this word, because this word didn't begin until later. Yeah. And then there was a real change probably in around 725 AD with the Norse religion. And you can look all of this stuff up online. There was a real change where, um, you know, uh, this word became a part of, of some place of torment and punishment. Well, that really came from a lot of mythological pagan beliefs and that began to enter in way back and, for yeah, and influence the way we looked at God. And plus it became, and you and I were talking about this and we were talking about how the church became a place of trying to control right. people and societies. The church and state became the a political and religious thing began agenda, to happen. And they began yeah. to use doctrine to control people. Yeah. I mean, Robin, you know, one particular group of people, they had that, they, there was a lot of money issues, a lot of power and control. Whenever you start looking at history, yeah. you know, uh, you know, there was a lot of stuff back there that, that caused people to go in the wrong direction. Yeah. And I, and I think that that, and then I think then we don't, we've been afraid to look historically of where some of the things that we believed in our modern day time and our doctrines, where they really came from. We've right. been afraid right. to go against the, the group think right. and, and the, and the way the hurt, the group, the, the herd thought. And, and we've been afraid to, to look at those things historically right. and take a practical look at that and say, when it doesn't line up to love, then you something's know, wrong. Something's with wrong. But, but right. I'm telling you, again, I love that statement that we made earlier. Our doctrines can't be, we can't uh, fit grace and love into our doctrines. Our doctrines have to fit into grace and love. Right. So, you know, that's what our grace and love has to establish how we view our doctrines. And when something doesn't measure up to love and grace, then we have to start looking 
at where did this stuff come from? Right. And yeah. I think those are the things that we've been on. We're talking about our journey, Terry. Right, yeah. And we're talking about what has brought us, as we've been establishing our hearts and grace, we began to ask these questions about right. ourselves. Historically, where right. did this stuff even begin at right. and why? Because if it wasn't even a concept of, in the Hebrew people right. of a place of eternal conscious torment, then how did we get this into our thought process right. in our modern day church? Right. So let's talk about that. There's so many things that you want to say, but uh, yeah. I, I think we're saying the things we need to say today. So even though the English word hell as we know it today did not even exist in the Hebrew and the Greek uh, language of Jesus day, the modern day translators mistranslated words into hell. For instance, uh, we found out that 54 times in the King James version, the word is hell. The word hell is in there. 32 times in the new King James, 14 in the NIV, and we could go right down the line. And you even pulled up something oh, a while man. ago. And man, and I think what's really interesting is though people, as, as we began to progress in our understanding, uh, the translations, modern day translations, hardly any of them even use the word hell at all because they cannot justify the translation that was done back in the 1600s. When you think about the King James Version was translated in the 1600s. Right. And then as we look at, at the modern day translations, most of them have dropped it out completely, began to drop out completely out of the Old, Old Testament, Testament. for and sure. And now it's almost right. dropped completely out of the New, New Testament. Testament. Because yeah. you cannot translate that logically from those Greek and Hebrew words. Because there's four words, one Hebrew word, Sheol, right. and, it, and it was translated different ways. And hopefully we look at that here, maybe. <laughs> uh, and then we've got uh, Gehenna, which is the big one that I begin to see whenever my eschatology began to change. I began to run all kinds of references on Gehenna. And then the word Hades is used a few yeah. times. And then the word Tartaru, Peter used it once. Yeah. So tonight we're going to talk about Sheol out of the Old Testament. And trust me, we are going to get in future weeks to talking about Gehenna and, and some of the references and some of the things in the New Testament and some of the things that we have misunderstood that been mistranslated of the things that Jesus was talking about. Right. And so that, let, let me make this weeks. let me make yeah. this point again. Jesus never used the word H E L L. Huh. Well, what the Right. Yeah. Yeah. She said that. <laughs> So since he never used that word, you know, we, Robin and I began to see the inconsistencies between the different versions of the Bible. And we began to ask these, yes. these questions. Yeah. Why were these words that were translated hell, they weren't consistently translated the even, same way. When they did it, they didn't even use them the same way because they have their own bias because they had an agenda really right. of how they wanted us to view these scriptures. Right, exactly. Yeah. So let, let's let's start with this first word, Sheol. Uh, this this word, Sheol, uh, that, that a lot of modern day translators uh, have taken completely out of the Old Testament um, for this word, English word, hell. Sheol is the temporary place of the dead, the grave or the unseen realm. Now this is, this is what they believed about Sheol. Okay. Um, the, uh, the Hebrews believed that everyone that died went to the grave, the wicked or the righteous. Yeah. Both of them. Both yeah. of them. So the KJV translators, King James translators, use the word hell whenever they wanted to convey it as a particular destination of the wicked. Can you see the control trying to begin right there? And I can tell you, go back and do a little bit of research and study on how the King James Version oh, yes. came about and, read. Really and just, just go back and look at some of those things. So when portraying the fate of the righteous, uh, the the trans they translated the word Sheol uh, instead of hell, they translated it grave. And then really they weren't congruent and they weren't even uh, consistent with that as as we're going to read just a few of those scriptures tonight. So this word Sheol in the Old Testament in the King James Version and we're just talking King James right was now. translated 31 times as hell. But Terry, I grew up thinking the King James Version was the only version of the Bible you should read. Yeah, that's a whole nother yeah. subject. Yeah. 
Uh, so 30 times it was translated grave, three times the pit, and one time the word graves. And you can look all that up on your Bible software program. So let's take a look at a few of these Old Testament scriptures where they were addressing the wicked, okay? In, in Deuteronomy 32, 22, it says, for a fire is kind, can, and remember, the, all of this is being written from their perspective. Right. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now, we're not going to explain everything that's going on within the scripture. We're talking about how they translated this word hell. Because they were talking about their enemies right there. Yes, they were. Yes. The for a fire is kindled. Well, if they were saying that it was God's enemies yeah. and shall burn unto the lowest hell. This word is the word Sheol. And so here, uh, this was a destination of somebody that was that God was mad at, that God was, it was opposite. Well, of, they were really mad at him. Yes. Okay. So that's just one scripture. Let's look at another one. Psalms 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So here they translated, the King James people translated this word Sheol into hell. Eternal in, conscious torment. Eternal conscious torment. But remember, the Hebrew thought process had it's very not. little little thought of of afterlife in in their in their uh, concept of their concept was about living life and being blessed in their moment. Okay, they have very little concept of an afterlife. So the wicked shall be turned. And even if they did, the word Sheol and the the words that were translated hell in the Old and the New Testament, again, was used very little, very few times in the in the scheme of things. Something that would be this important. Don't you think that God would tell us a little bit more about this? And I think that's the that's the thing when you begin to see that it, how how much it had been mistranslated I mean, and how little you think it would at least be in every book of the bible you think it would have been talked about a whole lot by jesus oh you would know that it would be in genesis you would find it right off the bat with adam yeah. and eve and i think those are the things we began to ask our questions about it's like okay so if it was mentioned very little then was it even translated right to begin with and i think and there's a lot of our other words not. in conjunction with some of these mistranslations of things. Yes. So so it says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And the reason why their 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 uh their thought process is on this word hell is because they were saying that the wicked again control is going to hell. So yeah. that was about control and fear on people's behavior doing the right thing. And so what if they would have just said the wicked shall be shall go to the grave, just like everybody else? They're gonna die. They're gonna die. And you if you're wicked, you may die quicker than the man who's living the right way. But instead they created this fear based concept of in a place of eternal conscious torment. Yes. So then Psalms fifty five fifteen says, Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. Into it's, eternal, con which we, should have been the grave. which should have been the grave for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Okay. And then in Proverbs uh, 9, 18, but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. And see, we're just taking these scriptures. I'm not even looking at the context, but you can go back even to the context of where these scriptures are and what is being talked about in this. They are saying, the King James people are translating this so that the wicked goes into a place of eternal conscious torment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then uh, let, let me just make these points because I think it's really important. The translators of the King James version needed to punish the wicked. So they needed for everybody to think that God was punishing the wicked, that God was into punishment. But we know because of what Jesus showed us in the New Testament, even James and John wanted to call fire down out of heaven and consume their enemies, just like Elijah did in the Old Testament. And Jesus rebuked them and said, you don't know what spirit you're of. God is not yeah. about punishing people. We missed 
the point. We have. We missed have the missed point. the point big time. So they needed to introduce the thought that their enemies would go to a place of eternal conscious torment. Point of control. They brought fear on people to control the masses. And whenever you control the people, you control the masses. Go back and do, just you look even in our day. You control the money. Yeah. And, and so... Um, Martin Luther was introducing the concept during that time when this was all being written back in the 1600s um, of the concept of righteousness by faith and not by works, which was impacting the control of the church. Right. And the church and the state were very connected. Right. And, and they were, then they were uh, struggling with control over people in their everyday lives. Right. So, so again, Robin, hell was an ancient tradition coming from an pagan an a, it was even before Tertullian got the concept in around 200 AD before the Norse religion turned the word hell into what we know it today what what it began to morph into and and um so so but it that that ancient uh, tradition was even back before then if you go back you know in those years before the coming of, of Christ you know um uh, thought processes of it, the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and all of them well, began just... to come into their teaching, even though it, even though the eternal conscious torment wasn't in the Old Testament, they viewed it as the grave. Well, Terry, just think about it. Just look. That's where some of the thought pro in the in the Old Covenant blood sacrifices came right. out of those pagan views of, yeah. of religion. All of those things about punishment, about God, that the gods, the pagan gods needed sacrifice and blood and punishment. And they be, they brought in those thoughts toward Yahweh, toward toward God. Right. And that's how they began to, that's how they viewed God. And so it wasn't a very big leap for them to believe in yeah. the thought process of eternal consciousness. So this yeah. thing is just developed and developed. And whenever you don't really check the contents and look at the facts and see how things uh, came about, you just take it for granted that the people that are teaching you and mentoring you that they already know everything that they've checked things out. But what if you go generation after generation and nobody checks, go we've back, goes, that. we've done that. But I love, but that. we're stopping that right here, Robin. But, but I love it. I love, I love it because God has been, or he, he this is, this is not a new concept to question these things. Yeah. People have done it and, and then it's been pulled back and, or it's been hidden. And then, but now because of technology and because there's right. so much of a wealth of information, you can really see that the things that we're questioning aren't really new questions. You can really start oh digging. And then you find out that lots of people a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, a lot of people that were saying a lot of this stuff, they were trying to infiltrate things with truth, but people didn't have, there was, there was way too many people in political and religious circles that had too much to lose to really begin to acknowledge some of these truths. Yeah. They, they thought that they would lose control over the people. And the truth is, is that they never had control and anyway. Listen. We've missed the point because it's yep. never been about control and force. It's always been about love and relationship, Terry. And when you measure up, start looking at how they use some of these words and where some of these doctrines come from, it is the opposite of what Jesus models. Okay, so Robin, we looked at how some Old Testament scriptures were translated in from Sheol to hell. And now let's look at, at this same scripture, at the at this same thought process, and then Sheol was translated in to the grave. When they were talking about the righteous or themselves. Right. So it God. says in Psalms 89, 48 out of the King James. Uh, and, and again, he starts talking here in this Psalms about a righteous man. So you're not going to put a righteous man in eternal conscious torment. No. Okay. So he says, what man is he that liveth? And again, the whole context of this, you can read this all throughout this. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? That's the same word, Sheol. Sheol. Why didn't they translate this hell? Because they were talking about the righteous. They were talking about a righteous man. So you yeah. couldn't put a righteous man in hell. They were making that delineation. But you can't. It's the same word, the same Hebrew word, Sheol. You've got to be congruent and consistent in your translation 
of, and I think, of words. And I think those are the things that we began. We began to see. Questions. Yeah, we did. I think we began to ask ourselves some of these questions. Why is this translated this way, that. this way, right here, and then not this over here? But Terry, you know what makes us safe to be able to start to be looking at this stuff, man, is understanding how much God loves us. Absolutely. And Without that, that understanding, you will never feel safe to to start looking at some of these yeah, things. So no, here's another so scripture, Job fourteen thirteen. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. There it is, that thou wouldest keep me secret. See, they couldn't have translated this for Job. They couldn't have translated this eternal conscious torment because Job was a righteous man. That thou wouldest keep me in secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me and set a time and remember me. So Job is talking in Job chapter 12, 13, and 14. He is answering Zophar out of chapter 11, one of his so-called friends. And he's saying, hide me in death till all of this is over. Hide me in the grave. So it could not have been translated into hell, into a place of eternal conscious torment. Because the word hell did not exist whenever the scriptures were written yeah, in the Old concept, Testament yeah. scripture, that whole yeah. concept. So then we have Genesis forty-four thirty-one, And it says, and it shall come to pass... When he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he shall die, and thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. That's the word Sheol. They translated it grave. They translated it correctly. And this is talking about Jacob. We can't put Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can't Israel. put Jacob, Israel, in into this place of eternal conscious torment. First of all, they didn't have any concept of that in in the writing of the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I'm telling you, in, in when we begin to want to to uh, use the scriptures and use our relationship with God to control people's behavior, this is what happens. This is what happens. We begin to miss the point. We get off course. And Terry, how much do we do that still now? Well, sure. We, we want to control like, oh people's behavior because it affects me, how people are living around me. But we'll never do it through fear. The only way that this is going to change is through the immense power of grace in people's lives. That's what's going to change men's uh, thought process. And Terry, you know what I love it and that you have said is that we do experience hell, but not eternal conscious torment. We experience negative torment right here, right here, right now through our cho bad choices. But do you know what? Our bad choices are come out of a result of not understanding who God is, not understanding who we are, that we are totally loved and accepted and chosen by God. And that's where those bad choices come from. And I think well-meaning people have tried to, instead of really believing that yeah. the love of God could bring Bring change to people's mind. They have used the short-sighted approach of fear right. to try to control. And, yeah. and I think I look at look at what's happening with the pandemic that we've been going right. through. How much fear has has brought torment to a lot of people's Absolutely. lives through this whole process, and has changed how we've had to approach everything. I'm not saying we shouldn't have made changes for safety, but man. Fear is not where we need. We no. need to do it out of wisdom, not out of fear. So, Robin, let me read one more scripture yeah, because uh, we're, from we're because we're out of time. Yep. But in Jonah two two, and here's another. Here's the. We could do this with each scripture in the Old Testament. In Jonah chapter two and verse two, this is the inconsistency of the King James version and how it was translated. And he said, and uh, it says here, and I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And the Lord heard me. I now now listen to this. And I said, I Jonah's crying out by reason of his affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I. Out of this place of how did they do that? Out of this place of eternal conscious torment. But it says here that he cried from that place, and God heard his voice. For great is thy mercy toward me. And thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So if we were to take this thought process of here, the word hell is used twice. Jonah was implying that God was going to deliver him from death, not, not, eternal, not conscious eternal conscious torment. torment. But if you apply our thought process to this hell, then and even, did... even as the translators translated this, that thought process doesn't work because you're, See, we've said eternal conscious torment. Well, Jonah's getting delivered out of it. 
Yeah. And, and Terry, this just shows you how much we have just fear has just entered it and how much we have, what we have been taught has skewed um, everything that we've read, that, that, that bias affected how they translated. Yeah. It. And then, then the, what we've been taught when that table of religion was set before us before as we were kids and man, and then we were taught that we were sinners and we were taught to, to be afraid of punishment. We were taught to be afraid of being separated yeah. from God. And you know, I tell you what, one of the things I love Terry, that we had a gal in our church that teaches in the kids class and our granddaughters in our, is in our kids class. Right. So she was, they were talking and there, they were, uh, they were watching a video. And in this video, it mentioned, um, the word sinner and our granddaughter goes didn't even know what a sinner was oh praise god our I granddaughter mean, didn't all even know she knows <laughs> is that she is loved and accepted yeah. by god and that jesus lives on the inside of her and yeah. she doesn't even know what that mm. word means she doesn't know how to look at god through fear she only knows how to look at god through love but man when i was growing up the whole foundation that was laid was about fear of being eternally separated from God. Absolutely. Robin, when you start seeing how good God really is, fear begins to fall away. It creates such a place of safety and trust that you can begin to ask these questions and you can see the non-congruence in the, in the way things, I'm not throwing the scriptures out. I'm just saying we better look at them in a, in a right way that will produce faith and not fear and, and produce the love of God. And I am so grateful and thankful, Robin, that we're on this journey and that we believe that God is so much better than what we thought and he I was. And I love this, Terry. Says, I do too. Oh, Psalms 34 eight says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I don't see anything about fear that is good. No. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts us in him. Robin, whenever you see how good God is and you begin to taste how good he is, the way that Jesus revealed the Father, he begins to taste really good in your emotions, in, in the way that you are. And you it's it'll be an automatic byproduct product to trust God, and to I, trust how good he is. Right. And I know that we, we're, we're throwing out some facts to you Yes, because I don't, we, we want you to take in what we're saying, but you dig it out and look for right. yourself, look it up and see if what Read we're books. saying is accurate. Look, get on the <laughs> internet, look up some of these things historically, look up things in the Bible software to see what the word, the actual words mean and just dig. Hopefully this gives you some, a jumping off place to look for some of this stuff yourself because you have to be convinced of this. Absolutely. Have you missed the point that, I mean, we yeah. had to come to the, to we the reality the point. that we had missed the point. The yeah. point of our relationship with God is not one that is based upon fear of punishment. It is one that is based upon unconditional love and favor that when you establish your hearts in grace, you are going to look at the doctrines like hell and you're going to go, where did these even come? How right. can these even measure up to what we know about God? Because they cannot. And so it is okay to ask questions and it is okay to say, yeah, I miss a point and let's get back on yeah, track absolutely. and really allow our hearts yeah. to be established in the love of God. I'm telling you what, that will create thankful hearts. It will. Amen. Yeah. All right. You guys have a great Thanksgiving. Yes. We love you guys. And Happy you have Thanksgiving. A All right. Bye. Bye-bye.